Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to my chapter-by-chapter walkthrough of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I started with the two towers, <laughs> not the beginning of the book, moved on to the Return of the King. Now I've wrapped around the Fellowship of the Ring, and we are at the chapter The Ring Goes South, because we have been through the Council of Elrond. We have finally got through the Council of Elrond. I love the chapter so much that I got a little ahead of myself in the last installment, talking about uh, the plan and the fellowship itself, which actually forms in this chapter and leaves Rivendell for what seems to be the sketch of the plan. Of course, the general plan is somehow to get the One Ring of Sauron to Orodrin, to the fires of Mount Doom, to destroy it. The plan here is to destroy it, not to hide it, not to lose it, uh, not to take it out to sea in a vessel, so instead of going east, you assemble a fellowship. The riders of, of the Nazgul are temporarily disabled. There are no major servants of Sauron in the east of Middle-earth. So instead of going west and south to Mordor, the plan could be to assemble a fellowship and go east to the Shire and then to the Havens, where Cairdan the shipwright is, get his best vessel, sail it as far to the east on the open ocean as possible, get Gimli and his fellow dwarves to make an adamantium, a mithril case for the ring, weld that case shut with the ring inside it, and throw it in the ocean. Uh, if you do that, it's highly unlikely that Sauron or anybody else is going to get their hands on it, but nevertheless, Gandalf thinks that the, the plan should be to destroy this, so that there isn't even a fraction of 1% of a chance, so that no one can get their hands on this again, much less Sauron himself. So the plan is, sketchily, is to assemble a fellowship to walk the ring in the general direction of Mordor. Uh, which will mean going south, crossing the mountains, going near as you can to the Gap of Rohan, which is a natural gap in the mountains, but you can't use the Gap of Rohan if what Gandalf says about Saruman the wizard, who is in Orthanc, right there at the Gap of Rohan, if, if Saruman is a traitor and has corrupted who knows what in that area, then you would be crazy to go to the Gap of Rohan. You'd be leading yourself right to him. And you don't know how dangerous that would be. So the, the, the plan is to cross the mountains by another pass and eventually make your way south to Boromir's people, to the kingdom of Gondor, where you will then formulate a plan to go from there. Boromir's going there anyway. You will formulate a plan to go from there to Mordor itself, to the dark to the Black Gate of Mordor. Uh, I, I, I'm sounding a little bit doubtful here because this part always confuses me. I said a lot of this in the last video. This part, the, the sheer logistics of all of this confuse me. Later on in The Lord of the Rings, we are going to meet the steward of Gondor, Denethor. He is a powerful, fell, formidable man. He has no love for Gandalf. And he knows a lot about what's going on. He knows about the ring. He knows about the quest. It doesn't seem to me... And when when the Council of Elrond is happening, Gandalf has just recently talked to Denethor. So he knows that. He's known the Lord of... Uh, the Steward of Gondor for the whole of his life. Aragorn has known Denethor for the whole of his life. And they have fallen out. They fell out a long time ago. They are at odds with each other. Personally, at odds with each other. To say nothing of the fact that if Aragorn shows up in Gondor, Denethor is out of a job. Um, it seems to me, again, just looking at the logistics of this plan, it seems to me that Gandalf would be every bit as hesitant to walk the One Ring to Denethor as he would be to walk it anywhere near Saruman. It seems that both of those plans are bad, but uh, nevertheless, that is the plan. Uh... <laughs> I have, I have all sorts of logistical complaints about this. Like, for instance, our, our heroes go close to where Radagast, the wizard, is supposed to live. He's not home at the moment. It wouldn't be all that hard to find him, I don't think. He's not much for traveling. Gandalf tells us that. And I, I bellyache last time that, that it just makes no sense at all that a second wizard who's available and unoccupied isn't on the Fellowship, isn't on this quest. And that, if it were true, raises the possibility that... Uh, Radagast could solve the problem. One of the, the favorite fan questions about Lord of the Rings is, 
since the Eagles show up to save the day a few times, including saving Frodo and Sam at the end of the Return of the King, why couldn't the Eagles have just flown the ring to Mount Doom and dropped it in? And the standard Tolkien fan response is that the, the great Eagles, Gwai here and, and his brother, are, are not normal Eagles. They're not normal animals. Sar, Sauron would know about them. We'd be able to sense them entering his domain. They're much bigger than normal eagles, for one, but they're they're also different. They are uh, probably semi-divine beings, much like the Balrog or Gandalf himself. Normal eagles aren't like that, nor are normal birds. So Radagast could tell a hundred of them to fly to Mordor at in staggered intervals, just as normal air traffic, and one of them is carrying the ring and just drops it into Mount Doom. Do we know whether or not that's beyond Radagast? Do we know whether or not that's beyond Radagast's ability? The animals are all his friends. They do what he asks. He's obviously able to give them complex instructions. So he's able to convey to them, for instance, to bring news to Orthanc without them knowing its name. So <laughs> that planet never happens. Nothing like that happens. I'm just, I'm just thrashing at the logistics here. But I'm not the only one. Because one thing, and one important thing that we learn in this chapter is that Gandalf and Aragorn, the leaders of this mission, are also thrashing about logistics. We don't learn the, the specifics of it, but again, Tolkien hints to us that they Frodo gets the distinct impression that Aragorn and Gandalf are at odds about what route they should take to go south. That they've had arguments that we haven't been privy to. And uh, some of that might have to do with whether or not the quest is being observed. The nine riders are temporarily unhorsed and disabled. But there's still plenty of spies of the enemy all over the place. Animals do his bidding as well as they as they do Radagast's bidding. Our our heroes are observed by a, a sweeping flock of birds who are not native to the area and seem to be canvassing the area to look for travelers. And also, ominously, there's a figure higher up than those birds flying uh, in the sky. Uh, and as Aragorn points out, they're flying. It's flying against the wind. So something there. All the 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 feeling that Tolkien evokes very well here, especially when our our group is in a uh, relatively peaceful area. The feeling that he's able to evoke is of ominous watching. That this is not the the sort of peaceful initial days on the road. May maybe that we our heroes might have experienced before they realized how attentively the Black Riders are following them. Those days are all over. Every move they make is being observed. How, in how great a detail and to what extent, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not sure that the text really reveals that. Observed by who? And for what reason? And in what detail? Is it Saruman who's observing our heroes, or is it Sauron from a distance? And if Sauron is observing them, why is he? Is he observing them because he knows they're bearing the One Ring? If that's true, then why aren't why aren't our heroes immediately beset by a platoon of trolls in armor? If Sauron has that kind of a detailed knowledge of where this thing is and where it's moving, I guess there are many powers between him and them, Gondor being one of them. Maybe that's the reason. Uh, either way, there's a pattern that is set in this very first chapter. This chapter shows the, the Fellowship leaving Rivendell. Without all that help that they could have, without all those elf lords that could have gone with them. They're leaving Rivendell in this chapter, and so this is the very first few minutes of the quest. The first leg of the journey, a minute thing, goes relatively well. But after that, a pattern emerges in this chapter that is going to stay through the rest of the book, which is that this fellowship cannot catch a break. The, the quest cannot catch a break. They hit trouble setbacks and then tragedy right away that first couple of weeks maybe they're fine but other than that it's all downhill and it, that happens in this chapter they are trying to make a pass over the mountain of caradras and it doesn't work so a snowstorm comes and it gets worse and worse and worse rocks start to dislodge are they being dislodged by the wind they seem aimed at our fellowship and there are fell voices in the wind and we don't know what they are. 
Is it natural sound? Is it the uh, strong winter blizzard playing with the rocks of high places? Or is it something else? And if it's something else, as Aragorn points out, and Gandalf seconds in the course of this book, maybe it has nothing to do with Sauron at all. This is one of our first indications that uh, one of the first times we're told that there are all kinds of supernatural creepy crawlies in Middle Earth that don't know Sauron. They aren't, they aren't pledged to him at all. Some of them have been here longer than he has. Uh, maybe it's them. Maybe that's the fell voices in the wind. Either way, the, our hero's attempt to, to do the pass that, what, that Aragorn had in mind, to go over the mountain in this pass, is completely throttled. The snow is just too bad. The rockfall is just too bad. The weather is too bad. It might have worked if it had been a company of elves. It might have worked if it had been a company of really strong men, like Aragorn and Boromir, who physically forced a path through the snow at one point in this chapter. But it wouldn't work for the hobbits, who are barefoot and not accustomed to this kind of weather. They're, they barely make it back alive. They barely, they barely make this essay on the pass alive before our heroes have to reconsider. This will not work. The mountain defeats them in this chapter. There is another route. And those of you who know the Lord of the Rings, of course, will know what that route is if you can't go over the mountain. And you can't go around it. Then the other route is to go under it. And in this chapter, we learn, we hear Gimli the dwarf, who's along with our heroes, we, we hear him talk about, he knows this area fairly well, and his people know it very well. The na they have names for all the mountains, names for all of the passes, names for all of it in their, uh, their rock-breaking language. Uh, Sam Gamgee at one point, point points out in this chapter, that, boy, that, the dwarven language is pretty rough. <laughs> uh, and that becomes necessary in the course of this chapter. You cannot go around the mountains, and you, you can't go over them. You're faced with only one alternative, and that is to go under them. So that is where we will move on to in the next chapter as we go through our, our read-through of the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, and I will, I will end this for now, and I will see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.